Okay, so let me start off by saying that this is not going to be a visually exciting video. But it's a story, quite a story, that we think that we should tell. We have found that a lot of uh, vloggers, other people that go to places, particularly those that go behind the, iron, the old Iron Curtain, tell stories of um, how friendly the locals are and how the food is just wonderful. And some of them you can see that they, they're hinting that something's not right, but uh, they won't tell you. They just like to give that um, that feeling that everything's fine and because they're traveling here, it's wonderful and you should too. Anyway, let's, let, we want to start the story with, um, well, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm Australian. I've never been to these places before. Now, being Australian means you're privileged enough in the past to have grown up and lived in a society that was free, where you had rights, and where you can expect justice and fairness. You do the wrong thing, you're gonna get in trouble. But um, as long as you don't ever do the wrong thing, you really should not get in trouble. Now that's the way I, I believe the world is, should be, has been for me in my life. Now, I believe in justice. I believe in honesty. I believe in the truth. In fact, I dedicated my life to that. But it's not like Australia or America or England or Europe in some places of the world. So I just want to start off by saying, well, we'll start off with the story of what it's like traveling to these places. And I'm not going to say all of these places because we have come across a situation in a number of places where we've asked local people, and in, uh, hang on, when I say a number of places, we've been behind the old Iron Curtain in the old Soviet, Soviet republics since November of last year. But the thing that I found straight, straight away I found very peculiar was, um, now, I don't speak a word of Russian, but most people in these areas do. But time after time, and that amount of time, Elaine has gone up to people and said, oh, excuse me, can you tell me where? And the people just go, oh, I don't know. I do not know. Not interested in telling us. Local people. The local people. I'm supposed to know. Yeah. So the local people that other vloggers explain to you how friendly and lovely they are, they'll say, I don't know. And you find out that, well, it's pretty impossible for them not to know that. Things like, where's the park, the central park? Which direction is it in? Oh, I don't know. So that, that's, that's something that that's, we found common um, all throughout these post-Soviet places. But we've come across a particular place where we've come across quite a few of the issues a little bit intensified. So going back, I don't you know what the date was, but we were in Kazakhstan. First of June. The first of June was it? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about when we came into the country. Anyway, we we. Oh no. You, th you think about it and tell us because I don't keep track of dates and times. But anyway, we we'd been in Kazakhstan and we wanted to go to Uzbekistan, and our plan was to go to their first city, their major city, which is Tashkent. Then we wanted to go to the uh, Silk Road city of Samarkand, which is uh, historical. Um, obviously, anything on the Silk Road is quite histor historical. Uh, and from there, we're gonna to go to Bukhara. And Bukhara was a place where also Silk Road type ancient things. You know, I, I, I like to go and see history. Um, so anyway, we left a place called Shimkent in Kazakhstan. 
we um, found that the, well, actually we came from Turkmenistan, uh, t- Turkestan. Turkestan, which is not a not a country; it's a city in Kazakhstan. And we found the easiest way to get around was to actually hire a driver. And we hired a driver who took us back down to Shimkent and then to the border. We got to the border, and so the first first thing you got to do is you got to walk through the exit area, so the exit of Kazakhstan. Then you're going to walk another couple of hundred meters with all your gear over rough paths. So you know your rolls on your bags are not really catered for. So you're going to struggle through with all your stuff, and then you come in. To Uzbekistan. That's when we start to find next level issues. Because Uzbekistan is different to the places we've been, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. These people are not Asian in Uzbekistan. They're, um, well, I had somebody explain that they were Tata, which are the people from Crimea, but um, they seem to be Turkish. They're definitely Turkic people. And I think that their language is probably close to Turkey. So they're, they're, they're Turkish people, which is, they're not Asian. So the first thing we did is we got to the border, we walked through. And then I noticed that we got a little bit separated at the time and I went ahead because Elena was carrying travel cap with her. And, um, I noticed straight away that I was getting pulled across. And of all the people walking across the border that day, they kept pulling me out of the crowd. And bring bring me over, come on, put your stuff through the the, uh, the x-ray thing. So, right, okay. And then I got questions like, um, how much money do you have? And um, show me your passport. And I said, well, my wife's got the money. And she's got the passport and she's just held up. She'll be here in a moment. So without them knowing that she and I were connected, as she's come around the corner, they've looked at her and pulled her across. Now, the thing that we have in common is that we don't look like Turkish people. We don't look like Uzbeks and we don't look like Kazakhs. So we were the only people that didn't fit either of those two categories. But we were both pulled, pulled over to the side and received special attention. But anyway, we were able to answer all their questions, weren't we? Well, they actually checked all my bag, everything, every single pocket. They asked me how much cash we have, uh, what, um, um, <clears throat> what cash do we have, in what countries, um, in, in what um, currencies. How much? Um, what passports do we have? What um, country citizens we are? How long we're gonna stay in the country? What is our purpose? So they asked me so many questions. Uh, I thought I'm uh, getting to some forbidden country. Hmm. Okay. So <coughs> and this was <coughs> after we got through those people. We probably would be lucky if we could go another 10 or 15 metres before someone else with a uniform and a submachine gun would say, show us your passports. No one else, just us. We had to show our passports. And I, I lost count of probably about eight or nine people that wanted oh, to see I our passports. Oh, I think not in that, about yeah. 12 maybe. Yeah, I, as I say, I lost count of about eight or nine. Now, and then when we got to the, you know, showing your passport thing and, okay, you, you're entering the visa, entering your passport with your passport, we're giving you a stamp. You've got 30 <coughs> days here if you're Australian. May I interrupt you? So when the, they were checking our bags and everything, they checked all our luggage. Kevin had to open every single bag and they checked meticulously every single item. Laptops, especially they were interested in laptops. Um, they asked, "What's this? What's that?" And uh, he had to point out and tell them every, what is that exactly. Every single item. But what I was trying to explain is that we were separated a little bit again, because when we got to the part where you got the stamp to come in, you got your thirty days. Um, I, w- I went ahead and I was pulled across straight away for special attention, and then Elena came around the corner, and guess what? Another time 
she was pulled across for special attention. And then we explained that we were together and I didn't understand a word they were saying. And Lena spoke Russian, so they had someone there that spoke Russian. So she was able to, I don't know what I would have done. So if you're an English person, English speaking person that doesn't speak any other language, um, just be aware of that. I, I really have no idea how you could catch a bus, catch a train, get across the border without speaking one of the languages that they have. All right, so, but Elena is obviously fluent in Russian because she was actually born in this region and lived here, was educated in Uzbekistan, but in Kyrgyzstan. So, and it was the Soviet Union when she was born. So she knows how this, these places work. And she did give me a fair bit of warning. She told me all about the dodginess and the corruption and all the rest of it. And, you know, I sort of, well, okay, well, we'll deal with that as we go. You know, it sticks in my craw. The whole idea of corruption and stuff, I really don't like it. But that's not the issue of the, of the subject of this video. So we're right, as Elena was saying. We, but we both got pulled out. And we got right through everything and I had to open the case. We got a particular case with all our camera equipment. What's this? That's a camera. What's that? That's a drone. What's this? What's that? Blah, blah, blah. But by that time they were excited because we had the cat. And oh, here's something. So they pulled her across with the cat. Got all the paperwork. It's, everything's legal. And I had to stand there for a good 20 minutes while Elena had to pay. How much money did you have to pay? It wasn't much. Uh, in Uzbek sums, 200,000 uh, something, 220 okay. or something yeah. like that. I but can't when, remember. Just to, in perspective, when we say it's not much, no, not, not much in Australian dollars, but to Uzbekist people, it was not cheap. Okay, so everything was legal, everything was organised, we had all the, all the paperwork we needed. But about the under 30 Australian dollars. Yeah, under 30 Australian dollars. However, what does that get you in this country? That's the point, darling. So 240,000, right? You can, that, that's your shopping for the week, isn't it? Right? Oh, by the way, um, they gave me a receipt for a different amount of money. Yeah, so, all right, so we know how dodgy it is. <laughs> okay. But anyway, we finally get across the border. Lucky us. And then straight away, and we know this, we've seen this before, up comes all the cab drivers. Taxi, taxi, taxi. That's the only word they've got. Taxi. And uh, how much? Now, we're not going to go into actual dollars or whatever, but they'll I tell can, me. I can, I guess I remember. If you want to, go on then. Uh, 250,000 sums, which was uh, roughly about 30 Australian dollars. Okay, now we've got, we use, we are familiar with the Uber. In this, this area, it's called, it's an Uber thing, but it's called Yandex. So you can go straight on there, see how much it is for a cab to take you from A to B. How much was 30 Australian dollars compared to the actual fare that it should 61, be? 61,000, which is. Okay, while well, she does that, the point is... Uh, 7.24 Australian dollars. Okay, so $30 if we go with the taxi, or if we got our own taxi, it would be $7.24. Now, bearing in mind, it's not a lot of money. We know that. But locally, it's a lot. So it'd be like saying $300 to $70, you know? But anyway. So, you know, Elaine is like, I'm not going to get ripped off. No, we're not doing that. So she actually got on Yandex and, and then rang the driver and said, oh, this is where we are. No, I can't pick you up from there. That's a protected area because those, those guys, those cab drivers, got a little mafia thing happening there, whereas a regular cab driver can't come there and pick you up because that's their zone. That's their rip-off people zone. But... That's the corruption stuff. That's the stuff that I expect. But what I didn't expect was what happened when we decided, well, listen, let's just get on a bus and travel closer to the town and then get a cab back in. What happened on the bus, darling? So on the bus, um, I asked the driver uh, if that's okay for him to take us to the city. And we've got three large bags and a cat. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I did not ask him how much it is. Um, I thought, well, 
I'm going to give him the, uh, s uh, the smallest um, note and he'll give me a change. Um, anyway, so I gave him the smallest note that I had, which was, I believe, about 20,000 zooms. And um, he doesn't give me any change. So I said, um, look, uh, is there any change you're going to give me? Oh, didn't you say you have bags and a cat? Oh, yeah, okay. So we didn't get any seats. We were just standing with all of all of our bags and a, um, and a screaming cat. And uh, by the um, middle of our traveling, the bus got very, very full with the people. And I um, have to give a credit to some of the locals, the old babushka. A little old lady. Yeah, she was. so there. embarrassed by what she witnessed. She kept coming up to, to us, well, not to me, because she knew I didn't understand, but kept saying she actually offered to give the money back to Elena because she was so embarrassed by the theft that the bus yeah, She said, you should us. have only given him 1,000. I said, well, I didn't have 1,000 uh, Zoom note. That's, you know, that's the smallest one I've got. Um, yeah, and another man that was standing next to me, he really helped me with the direction. Yeah, so that was very helpful. So we got into town, we got off the bus. We're just being ripped off on the bus. Okay, these things are not that big a deal, but we, we need you to know that this is what happens in these countries. They're not, oh, the people are friendly and the food's wonderful. It's not like that at all. Okay, there are good things about the place, and if you watch our videos, you'll see that we enjoy the places that we go. But you need to know what happens when you go post Soviet. In particular, you need to know if a person that's <laughs> clearly of English background, English speaking background, ends up in Uzbekistan, this is what you can expect. So we arrive in the city. Elena immediately realizes well, our phones don't work here because there's no cooperation between. One over that one side of the border with a phone company, another we have to start again. So she goes, Stay here with the bags, and she goes over to uh, a, a company to buy um, us new phone cards. So she, off she goes, she does that, she leaves me there with all the bags. I'm standing at basically at a bus stop. Fella pulls up in his little, little van. He's got a couple of passengers and off they go. He comes over, he tries to speak to me, he gets his Google translator out. He's clearly a, he's a, he's a driver, he's a cab driver. And I'm saying, man, I don't understand you, but we communicated enough to say, look, my wife comes back, yes, we do need to go somewhere, and provided you're not going to try and rip us off, because we do know the proper price, because we're on Yandex, then we will go with you. Okay, so... Elena comes back and he says, right, she says, how much is it going to be? And he says, blah, blah, blah. He and says uh, 100,000 sums, which is uh, roughly about 12 Australian dollars. Okay. Now, you got on Yandex and found out what, how much it should have been, which was? Which was uh, less than 61 because we were traveling less distance okay. from that so place. So 60%, so would... 60%. He's trying to rip us off by 45%. Oh, more or than that. More yeah. than that. Yeah. Anyway, he's trying to rip us off. No, 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 we're not doing it. Yeah, okay, then, he says, I agree to do it for the same price because we think we'll just call the cab and get a price from A to B because we've got an address, we're going there. Then we arrive and Elena tries to pay. What happens, darling? So I gave him because the smallest note I had was 100,000 sums. And, um, and he takes it and gives him it gives me some change and I'm counting and it was um, like twenty thousand less than what we, he's supposed to pay, and I pointed it out. He was wasn't very impressed, wasn't very happy. He gave me more change, still not enough. Uh, so it was about three thousand sums less than what he's supposed to pay back. But yeah, I thought, okay, whatever. But I'll just point out that on the trip there, he's saying, well, so you're tourists. How about I give you my number? Or actually, he kept wanting our phone number. Oh, we don't even know what it is. We just arrived. He wanted to, us to contact him, and he was going to take us around the city the next day and show us all around. And we thought, yeah, that'll be all right. But the, the idiot was still shortchanging us. He was still shortchanging us. He was, we were 
Chop, we could have negotiated a whole day of touring with him, but he had to try and shortchange it twice. Just, just outright trying to steal money. And that's what he was doing. So naturally, no, we weren't going to trust him. But this is where things get serious. So from here in Tashkent, we've decided we're going to Samarkand. Because it's a historic place. And then we're going to go to Bukhara. And then we want to head into Chad, the next country, Tajikistan. That's our plan. So we get oh, buying a train ticket to go from here. Tashkent to Samarkand was is a is a job and a half. Believe me, they even from Bukhara we bought a ticket from here from took Tashkent to Bukhara on a train, and then when we tried to buy a train ticket from Bukhara to to Samarkand, they said no, we don't have a train. We don't have any trains for that. And as I point, I said, well, darling, there must be a train that comes back because we're on the train that goes there. And went, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that can't be right. But anyway, so we had all kinds of dramas. But this is the people in the train station. Right? You've got to go there, take a number, sit there like it's, you know, <laughs> like if you're going to the, to pay your registration at the transport office. And then basically you can have any trip you want as long as you're prepared to go on the trip that they're prepared to give you. They've got no help, no, not interested in helping you, telling you when the train's are going to be, if you go online, no information. They've got a, they've got a website, but you can't get any information from it. So, but anyway, Elena, through lots of trouble and drama, organises us places to stay in Samarkand, places to stay in Bukhara. And then it was time for us to go. So we arrived near the train station, which luckily for us is literally across the street from where we stay. We get across the street, we've got all our luggage. We can't understand where people are going, they're going in different directions. There's a woman there that clearly just got off a train. Just got off a train. So Lana walks up to her and says, oh, can you just tell us where the, you know, the train station is that takes us out of here? Don't know, I don't know, she says. I mean, I understood what she was saying. She had literally walked less than 10 metres from the train station, we found out soon. That woman didn't know where she'd just been 10 metres ago, right? I'm sure she would have known if we were, didn't look like we're us, but no, doesn't, didn't know, didn't, wasn't interested in telling us. And then our fun really began. Because you rock up to the train station and then you've got this security set up. Well, actually, no. I know it's getting along, but this is good therapy for us. While we are in our apartment, before we decided we were moving on to the next city, I realised, what's going on with the internet? I just, it's just so slow, so slow. So I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. So I've got a VPN. Oh, everyone thinks, oh, if you get a VPN. So the TV's just not, not operating. I can't get anything through the TV, through the internet. So I go, I'll go on the VPN and find out what's going on. Get on the VPN. So the thing comes up, you've got a VPN, so we're blocking you. So since then, we, we've got no access to Netflix or uh, Amazon Prime or any of these things. Anything outside of Uzbekistan, forget it. You can't, you can't operate. You can't see anything because we used a VPN. Not only that, sorry for interrupting, if you are about to contact your loved ones uh, through um, Viber, um, through some other applications, forget about it. Viber blocks everything, it blocked everything. You cannot text, you cannot send a video message, a voice message, nothing, well, nothing. Gets better than that though, while we're on the same subject. The reason we're looking for Viber, which I've never even heard of, is because We've just gone and bought SIM cards for this country and we're trying to ring people. No, no, doesn't work. What's going on? Long story short, you have to register your phone with the Uzbek government before they'll allow you to make any phone calls. So that's why we're trying to use Viber and Telegram and all these sorts of things. But it's all blocked. It's all blocked. Okay, so... Internet, forget it. 
They, clearly, they're listening and watching <coughs> everything you do. Gets even better. When uh, the president of the big country was um, leaving this country. Hang on. And, uh, no, let me. Do. We're not going to be coy, okay? If you're watching that, the video <laughs> of Tashkent, everywhere we go, there's police everywhere. There's uh, guys with machine guns. You can't walk <coughs> up here. You can't video in that area. Why? Because some bloke from Russia is here. Now, just bear in mind, this particular bloke is the most wanted man on the, play, on the face of the earth. He is wanted in the International Criminal Court. Right? He is welcomed. More, he's so welcome that we're not, nobody's allowed to go within hundreds and hundreds of metres of where he might be that day. All right? He's welcome. Let's get back to what happened when we get to the train station. Again, you get to a train and you'd swear you were going on an international airline. You'd swear that we look like a couple of terrorists. I haven't finished about the blockage of the okay. phone. Block, block. So when he was leaving, I, was, oh, yes. I happened to be in the city at that time and all roads were blocked. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So they did not even lead, let people, pedestrians, cross from one side of the street onto another. So you had to actually stay uh, about 150, 100 meters away from the street and wait. And waiting was like uh, up to a couple of hours. So anyway, so I was coming back. They didn't let me to cross the road just like uh, everybody else. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just use my phone to entertain myself. And I see a message saying, um, you cannot uh, use your phone for 15 minutes. And I'm like, oh, never had that before since I bought my phone, which was like four years ago. Uh, okay, so I uh, re-downloaded. 28 and minutes we've been talking now. Um, and uh, no, the time is actually increasing. So, so I watched the whole cortege driving past. It was quite entertaining. It was uh, very full on. Lots of cars. Uh, but uh, I was able to use my phone only when I got home, got back home. So basically, your phones are blocked because Mr. Putin's in town, the international war criminal. Uh -huh. But he's welcome. He's welcome. No problems for him. I'm sure he doesn't get his bags going through x-ray. Anyway, we've been talking way too long. This is good therapy for us. And I know people probably aren't even watching anymore. But if you did skip through, this is what happened next. We go to catch a train. And of course, we're pulled across again. Just us. Nobody else. Everyone else is fine. Just us two suspicious looking terrorist people. All right? What's in your bag? Open it all up again. That's a computer. That's a camera. That's a drone. Oh, that's a drone, is it? Yes, that's a computer. That's a camera. That's a drone. What do you use the drone for? I haven't actually used it. The plan is that when we get to Europe, I'm going to do some drone footage, but I haven't used it since I left Australia. When did you buy that? Um, I don't know. Two years ago? I don't know. But I haven't even used it. Oh, okay. So, we sit there. Because somebody else has to come and talk to us, ask us the same questions. And then somebody else. And these guys are getting dodgier and, and, and scruffier. I mean, I know I'm scruffy, but these guys are like, you know, obviously important. And in the end, this one guy goes, all right, you have to come with us. Well, well, where are we going? All right, what we need to do, you, you can't have a drone here. Oh, really? Oh, we didn't know that. Yeah, and they can't have a drone here, so we're just going to go over here. We're going to fix the paperwork. So you've got the paperwork to go with your drone and then you can go. Oh, okay. So we go over to the, over, over with this guy and we stand there and, and we end up with like a dozen freeloaders walking around, stand there, blah, blah, blah. 
And then we go, so what's going on? Like, we've got a train to get, oh, yeah, you can't catch the train. Oh, okay. Um, so what happened to filling in some paperwork and then leaving? Oh, no, 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 you can't have a drone. Yeah, okay, all right, I'll tell you what. We'll give you the drone and forget us going around Uzbekistan. Forget us showing people on the internet what a wonderful place it is and how friendly the people are and how gorgeous and yummy the food is. I've had food poisoning. I've lost count, probably six times now. More than that. More than, more than six times. No, you buy, you're trying to buy fresh food because you know, that's what you do. Still right? get poisoned. Yeah. Don't eat the chicken. Trust me. Anyway, the food's wonderful and the people are so friendly. Well, we've met some more friendly people. Anyway, next thing you know, come on, you've got to come upstairs with us. And there's like 12 of these people standing there and we've got to drag all our luggage up these stairs, me and a woman, up these stairs, and they all stood there and watched us, all of them. We get up there, and what is this? Oh, this is the police station, is it? Yeah. Oh, we're just going to get this sorted out. We're your friends. And I, we said, we just, how yeah, about we just give you the drone, and we leave the country, and never come back. How's that sound? <coughs> oh, why would, remember the one that was absolutely shocked? Absolutely. Why, <laughs> why would you not, leave? why would you want to leave the country? <laughs> well, gee, I don't know. Because you've just stopped us from catching our train and you're treating us like we are a couple of terrorists. I wonder why we would not want to stay here. I can't understand it. Anyway, so long story short, no, short story long, we end up upstairs. I recognise that we're now in an interview room. <laughs> we've got... We've got the, the cameras everywhere and, the, the, you know, the, the glass, the see-through glass window. And they're sitting there looking at us and we're sitting there and I'm saying, OK, I know how this works. Not because I've ever been a criminal and any people that know me know why I know how it works. And I say to Elena, don't, just don't talk. Don't, don't say anything. Anyway, they come in and keep talking to, to, to me. They've decided they're talking to me, not, not us anymore, it's me. And I'm just saying, listen, I don't understand what you're saying. I don't know what you're talking about. Just let me go. Oh, no, no. All right. Um, well, I'm going to need a lawyer. I want a lawyer. Do I have a right to a lawyer? Yes. Wait here for a lawyer. So we got the lawyer. And the interpreter as well. Lawyer and an interpreter that they <coughs> chose. Uh, who the interpreter turns up from the local university. She is so embarrassed. She starts telling us, oh, oh you know, we're going to change the law because, you know, this is really bad for tourism. And I'm going, really? You think so? <laughs> that because I've got a camera in my bag, I'm going to be treated like a criminal? And they kept oh, this is a criminal offence. It's a criminal offence, like murder or armed robbery. So we're criminals, are we? Because we've got a flying camera that hasn't even flown. But it's all right, because we've got, what's that say on our card? Uh, the best lawyer. He's the best lawyer. Yeah. we got the best lawyer. Best lawyer you've ever seen, apparently. <laughs> so we got the best lawyer. What was he, about 23 years of age? Probably but it was okay. He's, he spoke English. He probably spoke about seven words of English. And then when the interpreter, they, the police come in and said, oh, Elena speaks uh, to the interpreter, English interpreter. She speaks Russian. So the interpreter, that's it. She's not speaking English anymore. She just starts talking to Elena in Russian. I'm going, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. You need to speak to me in English. <laughs> if everyone here speaks English, why aren't we speaking English? Oh, 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 well, she's quite put out by that, wasn't she? Oh, yeah, yeah, she, she suggested in the first place, uh, let's speak Russian so you can uh, translate it to your husband. Oh. And I'm like, what's the purpose of uh, having an interpreter in the first place? Huh. And now, anyway, but a lawyer turns up, apparently he doesn't speak Russian, but he does speak English. Well, if he, speaks, if he speaks English, I'll eat my hat. <clears throat> That's why I'm not wearing a hat, because I had to eat it. Anyway, crappy lawyer. 
It's just right on this piece of paper um, where you bought the drone, how long you've had it, what you were doing with it, where, how you got into the country, uh, came through your border control. To yes, I told them it was a drone. Wasn't a problem there, but now it's a problem. Oh, well, oh, and they're very interested in that. And they're going to find somebody and hunt them down because they let us in with a drone. I go, wow, yeah, this drone. Like, you know, <laughs> they're walking around with submachine guns, by the way. They asked us several times what was the purpose of you buying a drone. What, what was what was the what was it for? Uh, I don't know. What, what, what was it? What, what is the purpose of having a drone? What is the purpose of having a camera? What's the purpose? We go to uh, their version of Disneyland. Elena walks through. Doesn't look like a new spec. Guess what? Let's have a chat to her. We run over to her. Oh, she's got a camera, right? She takes photos of everything, everything where we go. You can't take photos here unless you're a tourist. So a security guard demands to see her passport. Look, I'm a tourist. Oh, well, that's all right then. In we go. Everyone's click, 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 <laughs> click. I mean, I'm probably 3,000 people taking photos and video. But any excuse to pull over anyone that's not Uzbek and go through their gear and see what's in their bag and what's in their pockets and how much money they got. Anyway, back to the police. So it turns out, long story short, I'm now a criminal. Um, haven't committed any murder, never robbed anybody, didn't break anyone's house, uh, didn't beat anybody up, didn't stab anybody. But because I've got a flying camera, I'm a criminal. We are not allowed to leave the country. They are forensically, which is a crack up, forensically examining a drone. Now, forensically examining means take the SD card out, put it in the computer and see what's on it. But that takes, that was Saturday. Here we are. What's the day today? Saturday morning. Today what, is the Wednesday. What day are we? Wednesday? Uh, 5th of June. Yeah. Wednesday. Right? Wednesday today? Mm hmm Tomorrow, we have to be there. We've had a phone call. We have to be at the police station at 10 a.m. Okay, what's going to happen? I'm not telling you. You just come here and we'll tell you what happens when you get here. So, this might be in my last video. It won't be Elena's last video. But if I end up in a Turkish prison, I mean, Uzbek prison, because I've got a flying camera, at least YouTube knows why. Anyway, this is going to be the only whinge video that I do for a while, unless I get arrested in some other country. He never, he never whinges. I would like to leave this country, and I'm not, never going to come back. And I'll leave it up to you to decide whether you think you should come here. Hello, our friends. Um, I'm going to tell you the continuation of our story, our arresting saga. Um, the day before we went back to see our criminal investigator, he called us and uh, he said, next morning, please uh, come over to the police station at 10 a.m. I asked him lots of questions. Um, where are we going from the police station? Are we going to stay there? How long for? Um, what's gonna happen to us? Are you going to release us? Um, you know, lots of questions. And he wouldn't answer any of them. Not because he did not know, because he just didn't want to. We arrived and we are waiting. Waiting 15 minutes, 20 minutes, he's not there. <laughs> yeah, sit on the steps of the police station. Can't go in, you're not allowed to go in. All our stuff in the cab. His Royal Highness, <laughs> the great uh, investigative officer, His Royal Highness is upstairs. He's left to send us a message through one of his underlings and he'll, he'll be down when he's good and ready. So half an hour later, he turned up with the papers and he said he the reason he was a bit late was because he was preparing the papers for us as if he didn't know didn't have all these five days um, since we are we are waiting for their um, response five days to prepare the papers anyway so um, he said we have to cross the road and I asked him why couldn't you tell us before 
where we are going because we had to go back to exactly the same place where we came from because um, uh, we lived there he knew where we live and um, he said well I don't I did not know where we are going well doesn't really it's not very believable anyway so um, we are with all our luggage uh, going to cross the road again it's a little update we are going across the road to the exactly the same place where we came from the Department of Transport <laughs> because the Department of Transport apparently is not for cars it must be for drive yeah. while we were crossing the road on the pedestrian crossing the bus nearly hit us and he was um, walking in front of us the criminal investigator while we were walking he said you wouldn't have all these problems if you did not bring a drone and i said we didn't even know that drones are illegal in this country he said nobody asked you to bring him he was quite aggressive and i said um well nobody asked us to bring lots of other things like our mobile phones, our laptops. You need the, your camera to record where you're going. You need you, your other things because you are a traveler, not, not to mention you need all these things for the everyday use. Um, anyway, the drones are illegal in this country. That's what he said. And I said, well, unfortunately, it did not say anywhere. There is no information online. There is no information on the border while we were crossing. By the way, uh, the customs who checked all our bags, they checked every single pocket of our bag, every single item. And uh, Kevin actually named every single item in the bag. This is the laptop, this is the um, um, drone. He actually said that this is a drone. And they did not say anything. They did not say it's illegal. You cannot bring it into the country. Anyway, so crossing the road to go to that secret place. He still won't tell us where we are going. And um, we saw two men fighting. That's quite hilarious. Two men fighting and a criminal investigator is just walking past. There is no more serious uh, crime then smuggling the drone unknowingly as a tourist into the country then people fighting on the road and the bus nearly run over you on the pedestrian crossing so we have arrived at the, our next destination uh, which he said it's a transport department that was uh, a little bit strange because it looked more like a prison it's got a big fence in front of the building. Uh, when we started entering the building, we saw men with the, uh, with the guns. Never seen men with the guns in the uh, tr transport department anywhere in the world. So yeah, we were a little bit worried because we thought they're gonna arrest us. And uh, anyway, so we entering the building Going upstairs, um, when we were already in the building, the interpreter has arrived. Uh, they took us into the room and we are sitting there and waiting. The lawyer is uh, still not there. While we were sitting in the room, three of us, me, Kevin and our interpreter, she said um, it's, it wasn't fair for us to um, have that experience with the uh, drone that it was taken away there were other people as well lots of them and she said it happens quite regularly at least three times a week and she told us a story a uh, quite few stories i mean uh, there was a couple um going through the same experience wife a uh, husband and wife wife was absolutely hysterical she was crying and crying non-stop non she was uh, absolutely stressed stressed because she didn't know what's going on they uh, those poor people coming from other countries um, suffering with all this unknown stress and uh, 
for what for? Then there was another man, she said, he was so stressed and scared, he, he thought that he was going to be arrested and taken to prison. Uh, he was praying to God the whole time. The whole time he was sitting in this room, uh, God, please help me, because no one else will. So, um, waiting and waiting in this room, we don't know what for. Uh, it turns out we were waiting for the criminal prosecutor. Not even kidding, criminal prosecutors if we murdered someone. So he has arrived uh, probably like 40 minutes later. So, and um, they're taking Kevin into the room and they're leaving me there. They said, you have to stay here. And I'm like, why? Uh, because we have to deal with him. Um, just with him. You cannot be with him at that time. Right now I'm sitting in the transport department in a room by myself. Kevin and I and uh, our interpreter were sitting in this room just a, a second ago. And uh, then uh, we've got two men coming uh, saying Kevin and interpreter should go with them and I have to stay here. So he was taken into the room. I'm sitting there and waiting not knowing what's going on and uh, about 10 minutes later they come back and they say um, look um, we need you to come back with us uh, they just could not communicate with him because our interpreter interpreter's English was that poor and by the way she is the best interpreter in the, in the whole city because she is teaching English at the university I don't know what she's teaching. Anyway, she is a lovely lady. I can't really say anything against her. She is absolutely lovely and she genuinely tried to help as much as she could. By the way, she doesn't get paid any extra, as we found out. But uh, she still could not um, get the message across to my husband. Uh, so they needed me. As soon as I arrived, they started speaking Russian. And my husband wouldn't understand anything. Uh, so... The, what was the purpose of having our interpreter with us if she could not communicate uh, anything in English? Anyway, so back and forth, she's speaking Russian with me. I am in, you know, translating into my husband so he can understand what's going on. Now they say, um, you have to sign the papers. And while we were sitting there and she was talking to, um, to me, about what's going on and I'm translating it to my husband. Our criminal prosecutor, he was sitting uh, on the other side of the table and uh, taping something. Uh, he's got the papers ready in Uzbek language and uh, he said to my husband, you have to sign them. We can't understand Uzbek. And I asked him, couldn't you please uh, at least, you know, Put them in Russian so I can understand what's uh, what's in there or can you uh, translate what is in the papers so we know what we are signing oh okay so um, our interpreter said I'll tell you what's written in here and I'm asking you how do I know that you are telling the truth because as we understood not everyone is telling the truth in that country how do we know that she is genuine? How do we know all these people are genuine? How, and Kevin is asking them, how do I know uh, I'm not confessing to a murder, like a cold case, cold case murder? How do I know I'm not signing my, um, my house to you? How do I know I'm not signing for something else that I'm not supposed to sign? They, no, 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 we are telling the truth. You have to trust us. That's pretty much it. So he signs the papers with his uh, uh, initials and above them he signs, I do not understand. So they see the papers, the criminal investigator. Oh, I don't like that. Um, see you, by the way, he doesn't speak Russian. 
and he speaks a little bit of English but very very poor English so we could not understand what he was talking about so it was pretty much body language um, so uh, they <clears throat> he said that is not good enough you have to remove that Kevin said can you just cross it out no you cannot cross it out uh, I'll print other papers and you'll sign them with your true signature uh, otherwise we will not release you we will have to arrest you and uh, um, you know put you in prison so eventually um, they insisted for my husband to sign the papers in a language he did not understand and um, we just had to trust them obviously they said um, you have no any other option you cannot we cannot give you the papers in english or russian that's only the uzbek documentation we have that's only uh, that language allowed in this country so um and we just had to obviously believe what they're saying because we did not have any option we are in the building that looks like a prison with the people walking with the machine guns so he did sign the papers we are homeless but we are free yay <laughs> just a little bit lighter because we've had two thousand dollars worth of stuff stolen from us by the uzbekistan government but uh yeah feeling good so we spent about uh, two hours in this building interrogated by criminal investigators and yes we are not exaggerating criminal investigators signing papers in uzbek language that none of us understood but we had to sign them i hope um, there won't be any consequences after that we'll keep you updated okay so as you can see i did make it out um, it was pretty touch and go there didn't know what to believe because I'd, I'd run out of lies run out of counting the lies that they told us they told us so many times just sign this you can go well we just kept signing things um, and we could never go so um, anyway we made it out the young bloke who was the uh, trainee prosecutor walked us out and uh, after us being told that um, no, no, you've got to sign this, it's all written in Uzbekistan, but that's the law here, the young fellow mentioned to Elena something that a typical, we found out another thing that was a lie. And what did he say to us, Dale? He said, um, I'm sorry for what you've been through, but you have to understand that a um, uh, law of Uzbekistan requires uh, to have paperwork written only in Uzbek, Uzbek language and Russian language. And I'm thinking to myself, hang on, didn't they say in that room that uh, according to the law we can only sign uh, papers in Uzbek language? Because I asked them specifically, can you please print it in Russian so at least I can understand what's going on? But they wouldn't. No. So they were determined to have me sign things that uh, I didn't understand. And um, I did things that I knew to do, like write down, I did not understand this. Uh, the old mate prosecutor, he understood enough English to know that I, I had uh, uh, what I'd written there. Um, at one stage at the police station, I had to sign a book to say that uh, I wasn't lied to and I wasn't treated wrong, uh, incorrectly, and I was treated with respect and not pushed or pressured into anything. Um, and so what I ended up doing is I signed it, Mr. Squiggle. So... Uh, if they ever produced that one in court and they said is this your signature saying that uh, everything was above board and you were treated properly i'd be able to say no that's not my signature but anyway uh, i'm sure most people just go along with whatever they're told it's just a miracle a l just luck that we're we actually got out uh, i i've no idea what was going on i know that if they were being fair income they wouldn't have been speaking to us the way they were they wouldn't have been treating us the way they were. In the end, when the young bloke, sisters out of the prison, passed the guy with the submachine gun and uh, out through the security gates, 
got to the front of the building, another wonderful detective walked up and said, oh, shoe on, come on, you can't stand in front of the building here. And we're just trying to get a, a cab to leave because all we wanted to do was just get the hell out of the country. And um, so, no, we got shoved out into the out of the car park, away from the doorway so they wouldn't, people walking past wouldn't be thinking, oh, I wonder what they're doing to those people in the Department of Transport. Um, so anyway, we did finally, we got a cab, went to a bus station, got on a bus and we thought, we're free. <laughs> we're out of here. This is wonderful. <laughs> We've made it. And we're thinking, oh, wouldn't it be lovely if the bus, you know, because last time we had to walk across the border, wouldn't it be wonderful, this perfect if the bus uh, pulled up, they come on board, checked your passport and said, yep, yeah, all right, you're leaving, stamp. Um, and let us go and then, you know, get into Kazakhstan and then them say, righto, here's your, let's look at your visa situation. But no, the bus stops. And actually, just to cut into myself, one thing I did explain in the first part of the story at the beginning of the video was we'd already been through the immigration part where we had our visa stamp, we had our passport stamp. That's, and that's when you do normally get asked how much money have you got, how long do you plan to stay, where are you going to, because they're legitimate questions. But that's not the people I'm talking about that kept asking those questions. We, every five minutes, we were stopped by somebody, an armed person, uh, and asked how much money we had. Now, I know they had no interest in what kind of visa they were looking at issuing us, because we already had it. We already had our stamp. They were, that, those questions shouldn't have been being asked. They were there for security purposes, and believe me, anyway. So here we are, we're leaving the country, we're home and hose, the bus stops. And I thought, oh boy, here we go, bus full of Uzbeks and Kazakhstan people. The bus driver was a pretty decent Uzbek guy, and uh, didn't really speak English, but could communicate with Elena. He was going out of his way to be nice and friendly, and we're thinking, finally we're meeting a nice Uzbek as we're leaving the country. And I'm thinking, when she's pulled up and explains, right, everybody have to get out, take your stuff through through the border. I thought, oh, you better let us off first because I'm pretty certain we're going to take the longest. And unfortunately, I was not wrong. So we got there. And again, again, everybody walks past. Everyone gets their little stamp to say you've left the country. But no, not us. We are pulled aside and going through our bags. I, I'm surprised we didn't get strip searched, but uh, honestly, uh, there were, these guys find stuff in our bags I didn't even know we owned, you know, right? but you know, the, the bag lock is worn out. It's like a brand new suitcase, but it's worn out from the amount of times I've had to lock it and unlock it, open it, close it. Oh, in the end, I stopped locking it because I couldn't go 10 meters <laughs> without having to get searched again. Just us, just us. Whether it didn't matter if we were together at the time or whether one of us walked ahead and the other one was was lagging behind, we'd still, both of us, would get pulled apart. Now, you make your own conclusion, and if you want to be a tourist, just think, just know what to expect. But, anyway. So, we get to the part where we're about to leave. Now, um, I'm on my Australian passport. They check through, and I'm thinking, oh, I hope these wonderful dictators, I mean detectives, don't, uh, haven't put us on the immigration list of crim wanted criminals, you know, that'll be the next thing. And uh, I stood there, old mate stamped me out, and there's the door, I'm out of the country. Great. Elena gets pulled aside because she's got the cat, and I went, right, okay, that should be, you know, how long can they keep her back with a cat? I'm standing there, on the other side, in freedom, outside of that horrible country, Waiting, 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 waiting. And I look over, and here's Elena being pulled aside by the guy that's going to, supposed to let her out. All right. And she's just like there, like I, I could touch her almost, but she's, they're just, and I'm standing there with all the bags, because I brought all the bags with me, and she's, she's standing there being, having a good old conversation. Now, this is a beauty. Elena, could you explain what the issue was now? Just trying to leave. What was the issue? 
Well, first of all, I had to stay in three different queues before they actually served me. And one person sent me from one queue to another, so I lost good like 20 minutes. Then finally they said, ah, oh, where's your registration? I said, what do you mean registration? I'm not Uzbek citizen. Um, they said, that's not what I mean. You had to register uh, entering the country within three days. And I'm like, uh, where do I get all this information from? Uh, we are, and that's a neighboring country I came from. It shouldn't be any. And I checked online before actually coming to Uzbekistan because uh, um, I thought, well, we better to follow the law of the country where we are going to. And I didn't find any of this information. So, okay, so they pulled me aside and I'm waiting, seeing all these people walking past. Uh, anyway, uh, waiting for about half an hour, if not longer. Then someone arrived. Oh, actually, our bus driver has arrived and he said, what take you, takes you so long? I said, uh, my registration. So he went to that room where the customs are sitting and uh, talks to them in Uzbek. Then someone comes out, takes me and another lady into the other room. Obviously, another lady had a shoe. If I could just say, if I could just say, the bus driver. I mean, you didn't have to speak a word of Uzbekistan language, whatever it might be, to understand that bus driver was just giving it to him. Oh, he was. Like, so he excellent. knew. He knew it was all dodgy, and he gave him an absolute mouthful. And that's when they become a little bit sheepish then. And um, anyway, he was a big guy too, so he comes and stood beside me and he's standing there like this, you know, and he's like showing them that he's not happy with what's going on either. But they take Elena off into a little room and um, she secretly records it too, thinking, well, this one's going to end up in court too. At least I've got proof of what's going on. So she's in this little room and what did they say to you, darling? Right. So I did not record the whole conversation because it was, yeah, I was a bit worried. Anyway, um, the young guy who is um, taking all my details, passport details, and uh, my the amount of days I stayed in the country, asking me all these unnecessary questions, um, he said, uh, "Do you know that you have to pay the penalty?" I said, "Well, how much? Um, it's three million four hundred uh, sums." which is roughly about 405 Australian dollars. And I said, uh, okay, so uh, uh, what am I going to do? Like, I'm jobless and I'm homeless. How am I supposed to pay for that? Um, and um, what's going to happen? you asked them if you're going to jail, didn't you? Yes, I, I asked them, uh, what's going to happen to me if I can't pay? Do, they, do you put me in jail? No, no, we won't do that. So what's the worst case scenario for me if I won't be able to pay because I don't have the money to pay? Um, he said, in this case, well, first of all, he said, today is your lucky day. You've, you've got a 50% off. I <laughs> could not believe what I heard. A big sale. <laughs> a big sale at the corruption warehouse. <laughs> That's a huge sale. 50% off. Don't, don't miss out. It's hard out, Michael Hill. <laughs> Don't miss out. So yeah, from three million four hundred sums, you only pay one million seven hundred. Woohoo! So I was excited. Lucky. <laughs> How so lucky, lucky. So lucky. I said, well, look, uh, I'm still homeless and still jobless. How am I supposed to pay even this amount? I, I don't have the money to pay. Um, Naughty cat. I asked him what's going to happen to me if um, I won't be able to. Um, he said, in this case, you cannot enter the country within three next years. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I decided not to show my excitement, but yeah, I kept it quiet to myself. Hmm. So that was pretty much the, the final straw, the last goodbye from Uzbekistan, another shakedown at the, <laughs> at the, the border. Um, nobody asked us about a drone though, did they? They still didn't no. like it. Oh, no one said, oh, listen, have you got a drone or anything? No, no, no one cared about drones at the border. They got a different scam running there. So what happened to our drone, by the way, darling? You know, like, as you can understand, because drones are very dangerous items. So what did they tell you? back at the uh, transport department 
was going to happen to our drone? Uh, the, not, not that they told me, but I found that information myself online. Um, it actually, what happens to your drone, confiscated drone, it goes straight to the Uzbek um, uh, Defense Force. Right. Straight to the Defense Force. So the whole scheme that they're running is instead of buying drones from China, like um, anyone else seems to, the only way that they can... Um, assist in the war <laughs> is to uh, steal tourists drones so anyway um, I'm sure there are people out there at the moment think well doesn't matter ignorance of the law is no excuse like everyone everybody knows that you can't take a drone in that country well does everybody know that uh, you randomly get fined four million penge for not signing so, so. So, so. Sum, sorry, uh, for not, I don't know, what is registration? Telling the government where you are. Remember, this is the government that quite clearly chokes your uh, internet, um, monitors what you're doing, and if you use a VPN, they cut you off. That's the end of you. They, they just flick a switch and that's the end of you. Oh, you try to out, you exactly try to out smart us. Yeah, what we are doing. So, you know, hello, North Korea. Hello, Uzbekistan. In Kazakhstan now, darling. Yeah. Are you happy about that? It's cool to be here, man. It's hard. It's been a bit of a day, hasn't it? It was. Escaping. Yeah. Escaping the clutches of those. It's really there. Uzbekistan people. <laughs> and our last word as we finally leave Uzbekistan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it's not.